We'll get started with those uh, screens. So these sort of have evolved from um, going to the physio and having an injury and then they having sort of um, been figured out ways to sort of every day in training as you're warming up, figure out what areas are tight and then we've then got ways to mobilise those areas. So what's first, Kels? So scarecrows, the first thing Kels will do after a bit of warm-up is just basic internal external rotation and um, she can sort of feel whether there's um, anything tight or there's sort of inhibition either on the back side or the front side um, and whether she's hitching so that sort of um, creating motion via the, the trap and that's that's been a really uh, obvious sign that there's some sort of pain there so go back to normal motion so that's normal and then if she hitches that's her obviously avoiding and trying to create range where there isn't any. Um, and then it's always sign, a sign of internal rotation deficit. So what is your go-to? Yeah, so the internal... Oh, sorry, can you, you can all hear me? Yeah, so if I have a loss of range, uh, normally it's like internal impingement. So generally for me, it's like I'll loosen up through the back. So I'll just get like a spiky trigger ball, lean up against the wall and just really like get in there, try and like self-massage essentially, uh, and then I'll come back and retest it. Oh, I, I can do the bit now. Okay. <laughs> that was all for that one. And so I mean, obviously that's a, a pretty straight up and down test and it's a daily test. Um, and sort of obviously you can do a pre and post triggering anyway and sort of see whether you get a bit of range. It's obviously sometimes that loss in range is just simply a bit of fascial tightness and some basic triggering will create it. If it's still there, then we make a call as to whether we change what we're doing that day to actually obviously work around that tightness and then try and get in to see our, our soft tissue guy or our, our physio elevations next one. So, um, um, oh, this is just a really, really simple test. Uh, so it's not much. All I need to do is kind of lift my arm and if I can get it past my ear, <laughs> Uh, it's good because I, when I had my shoulder problems, I'd get up to this point and it would, it was sore, and so that was a really good sign that things weren't working very well. So yeah, if I got to this point, it was like, no, nope, grabbing really sore. I then have to go away and do some more trigger mobilisation. But if I can actually get my arm moving. So the important part of that is when they do do this, that there's not a hitch either in the thoracic or the lumbar spine. It's purely just motion through the shoulder, she's not trying to get the range elsewhere. And this is where the athletes really just have to be honest with themselves and not try and achieve, you know, better results. They've just got to be honest and stick to the testing so they don't uh, try and mask issues which are there. Uh, so they're moving down to the back. So the first one, this is just really to get a sense of what's happening with my lower back, is this the lunge, uh, arms out straight and then rotating both ways and then switching and rotating. So what I find is um, left side block side, if I'm a bit tight through that QL or top of glute, uh, I'll catch going this way, so I'll only get that much range. Or then when I try and open up towards the back end of it as well, I'd kind of get like a, a catch through that top. So being able to open up, um, or clear to throw. And so for me as a coach, what I'm looking for is just fluid movement. So if Kelsey gets sort of has to work through a bit of range, it's pretty obvious to, to see. So for me, I'm always just watching these tests to make sure that it's just flowing motion. She's getting the range of motion without having to grind her way through it. Yeah, and I guess for this one, I do allow my hips to kind of turn a bit with this open, open range one. So I kind of let the hips go with it. And then so you can climb that end range as well. Or I guess you could kind of lock the hips off as well. But we tend to do that one seated uh, because then you really are locking off the hips and you just get a pure sense of thoracic rotation. Uh, the next one's just a simple bow and arrow. So again, on the ground. And then just opening up, working through range. So obviously if this is coming off the ground, they're trying to hinge and... <laughs> Uh, get range somewhere else, so it's important to obviously stabilise the bottom there. This is very tight today, so. <laughs> Good. so usually that you know, top hand hits the ground pretty comfortably. 
And it, sometimes it takes a few just to open up and find that range, but again, the important thing is to make sure that you're opening up your thoracic and moving through there and not just kind of flopping your shoulder down and getting it. So, you know, you, can, you might be able to touch the ground there or down there, but actually just coming straight over and across and finding and standardizing the way that you do it. Oh, so the next one is a slide test. So these ones is pretty much, uh, I just walk straight into physio, my physio is standing there, he doesn't have, even have to say anything, I'll just jump straight into it and then he can get a sense of what's, uh, what's happening. So it's a few basic movements, side to side, and then we add a side, rotate down. Again, we're just looking at the fluidity of the motion, again, sort of go forward. About that point, as she starts to sort of slow down or grind through it, it's obviously there's a bit of stretch pattern. Um, okay. So the stretch pattern tightness, usually through sort of this range on the opposite side. And some, again, some of that's fascial, so it might just take a little bit of soft tissue um, massage to get rid of it. Um, and so this one was the compression with rotation. So this was the one for a lower back injury that's really, um, obviously you're, you're putting the lower back under a pretty compressive rotated load, which is a bad position. So this one shows up pretty clean. If they have instant pain, there's obviously something going on there. Um, so the aim is to just slide your hands down your hamstring. And then uh, the other one, uh, this one's quite a funny one because uh, traditionally speaking, I should get pain when I do this because I have past fractures, but um, every time I do the test, it's asymptomatic. So, <coughs> way back when I first went in for screening um, and this test came back negative, it was one of the reasons I didn't get my back checked straight away. So, um, this one, single leg, leaning back and then rotating side to side. So that should come up with, with pain for me, but it never did. So now it's just more for another screening method. So again, um, obviously it's really good. Kels is a very proactive athlete, so she just diligently does this every session. I don't have to say it. Um, she's quite lucky. Uh, and I mean, that's just a sort of a reflection of her professionalism more so than me having to hound her over the years. She just is one of those athletes that just okay, knows what she has to do and just gets on with the job, which really makes it easy to coach. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that, that would be something you do before every throwing session or every training session? Uh, mostly throw sessions. Uh, just depending on how my body is before a gym session, I might just run through a few of them just to target um, a specific warm-up that I might need for that day. Yeah, so with squatting, I'd probably want the, the hip and the back ones. Definitely, just to make sure that there's no imbalance. You're just not going to start rotating to one side when we get deep. So for hip flexors, just really, really simple for me because I know my body now. Uh, it's just a simple stretch here, just pushing the hips forward. So Mike spoke about like pelvic tilt. So I'm just uh, tilting my pelvis in this one just to get a sense of what's happening. And then I also lean into it. And that's just, for me, it gives me really good feedback on what's happening with my hip flexors and whether I need to spend a bit of time on them in my warm up. Cool. Any questions on those specific tests? Again, they're just diagnostic, they just give us an idea of what we need to work on, where there's a little bit of tightness and um, so that we're not getting into movement and then finding the, the tight spots and um, it's just sort of a shortcut to avoiding things and so we kind of know that if Kelsey loses that elevation as well as internal rotation that um, we just don't throw that day we just pull up stumps before she's even touched a, a ball or a javelin because it's just not worth uh, the risk this thing works well. so oh so have a jump up on that we'll do the deep internal rotation line, okay? yes do you go with the feeling or do you have some numbers Yep, so jump elevation test. Oh, yeah. So we, we do measure the elevation um, with this soft tissue therapist. So we do, you basically, he's got an iPhone app. It's a real crude measure, but at least it's, oh, sorry, actually does have a gunny on it. Um, <laughs> so up and then just measuring the degree of um, off zero. Generally, it's somewhere between zero and minus five. So you can't actually get it up. 
um, <laughs> and so you know, sort of, it's somewhere under under minus five. That it's it's tight, and then internal rotation. Stop on there. Back. Passive. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, these are your basic tests. These are the towel under Kelsey's arm, and it's just um, internal rotation, external rotation, and we get a number. And so we've got data from that from the last two and a half years, weekly measurements, and so we kind of, and then, so every day Kelsey has to fill out a monitoring uh, online through Australian Sports, so it's got wellness data, so sort of what's your mood today, um, how's your stress in sport, how's your stress in training and life, um, what, are there any specific areas of soreness? What's a rating out of 10 for those? Um, what's your general body soreness? What's your preparedness to train today? Are you mentally ready to train? All this sort of stuff. So this is a big project we've tried to put in place to, I guess, trying to find out what is important. And I think uh, for Kelsey, we've kind of found the mood. Her mood sort of goes between a, out of 10, the 10 being awesome, one being Horrible goes between nine, eight, nine, ten, nine. And she's a pretty, pretty stable person. Whereas other athletes, you know, depending on their personality, you might get a, a two to an eight to a three to a six. Like some people just bounce up and down. So for those people, those tests are maybe a little bit more useful. But for Kels, I come in the morning. Hey, feeling today? How you doing? You can't see where she's at. But what we found is important are those specific sorenesses. So she. If she reports um, anything above a three, uh, our physio gets an email straight away saying that Kelsey's lower back is above three out of 10. Um, maybe just give her a call or touch base with her today. And then I can go in and we can look at these trends. So then we've been able to match up the loss of range in these tests with the soreness. And we can match up, match up our training load and we can kind of see what causes the lose range and now we've also been looking at what, whether those changes and ranges and stuff have affected the quality of the session. So, um, yeah, it's kind of that's the thing with data. You can collect lots of it, but we've managed to find meaning in some of it, not all of it. And we're trying to get rid of all the, the meaningless data, the things we don't want to have to record because, again, it's more stress than the athlete. They have to sit there and answer 30 questions before they go to bed or when they wake up in the morning. We're trying to bring it down to a few. But, um, so the hip internal rotation 90 test, so sit up there. Yeah, so the, um, those tests that we said were quite uh, specific to Kelsey's um, back soreness, so hip straight, so hips in a straight position, internal rotation of the hip. Uh, it's external. Yeah, so internal rotation of the hip. So we'll have a, the, the strain gauge, which we use it's like a load cell, so we stick it on the wall with a suction cup, and Kelsey internally rotates the hip against it um, with the maximal effort, and we get a number. And so when Kelsey was doing that, she was actually getting um, soreness, pain in the lower back. And what that actually showed up to, showed up for us, was we actually thought she had an, uh, a hip, an anterior hip uh, impingement that was not it was causing the back, so we thought it was actually a... We thought it was actually a psoas tear. Yeah, we thought she, thought she actually had a tear in her psoas because of that loss of range, and that's where the pain was coming through, so did a single leg squat. Um, the single leg squat became pretty... She couldn't do this without... Um, without obviously collapsing at one point. Do it front on curls so they can see hip range. Um, so if you look at the, the traction and the way the, the hips tracking past the knee, Kelsey would get sort of to this point and just almost hitch. And so we thought that was actually hip pain, um, a hip tear. But that hip pain was actually coming from a lower back, uh, obviously the pedicle, the L5, where the uh, muscles are attaching. So for a field test for that internal rotation, we use the single leg squat to sort of test whether there's um, to try and help develop that strength uh, for health. Um, and someone asked me yesterday, like, Mike, if we don't have that strain gauge system that you have, how can we measure these hip external rotator, internal rotator tests? So, uh, jump you back to adduction. Oh, stomach. So, I mean, stomach? yeah, oh, back. 
So yeah, add up. So I mean, it's as simple as you know the athlete knowing themselves. So Kelsey's is going to do adduction. You can get it a push on the outside. Push. Can you feel the difference? Yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, it's, it's as simple as that. You don't necessarily need to have numbers to get a feel of whether there's weakness or inhibition. And um, so, I mean, from a field test perspective, that's what we do. We just you know, we can't take that load cell with us on tour every year when we're away for two or three months, so we just come up with basics like that to try and um, bridge the gap between what we can do in the lab and what we can do in the field. Um, any other questions around that hip stuff? Cool. So, what we'll go through now are some of the exercises that we do for our, um, on those circuit days. So, again, uh, we talked, I talked about yesterday about, you know, it's really easy to develop a lot of uh, single plane strength, so things like um, on the bench, yeah. exactly uh, things like you know pure hip extension or step up. So on those uh, other days in the gym, what we do is we try and develop, um, I guess, multi-plane motion. So in this case, we've got a step up. But we've also got the added resistance of the band trying to pull Kelsey in inwards. And so what you've got there is you've got obviously that you know the, the pure plane of motion. Um, step up as well as the external rotators have to switch on to resist um, rotation and Kelsey falling through so we're getting a double barrel sort of I guess it's more specific way of um, developing strength through a hip so rather than just a simple flexion extension she's also having to recruit her external rotators to stop herself from losing a hip inwards and I mean if we think of a block position and throwing that's kind of what we're doing we're trying to hit and stop that external rotation so this is one way that we can develop uh, external rotation strength out of isolation and in, rather than just sitting there doing lots of you know clams on the ground sort of that in out motion and so we're actually developing them um, together and so the other way to do this and Chelsea hasn't done this before so <laughs> this is this an experiment um, is to use the outside leg and that how's that feel what do you feel different there <laughs> Yeah, so the, this way she's getting her adductors and um, stabilizing the opposite direction. So again, it's all about just playing around with things and you know, this sort of stuff is low risk because there's no real, we haven't got massive loads in the bar when I'm trying to, um, not putting on a lot of stress, but it, it challenges the athletes, it makes her recruit those external rotators, internal rotators of the hip to actually um, uh, help with that sort of coordination as much as anything. So, someone asked me yesterday, how do you, uh, how did you guys um, keep the strength up whilst having a, uh, not being able to do any traditional squatting, deadlift cleans in the gym when you had a lower back stress fracture. So, uh, we uh, were lucky enough to have this big green band, which became Kelsey's friend. Um, so, anything that was hip fixed, anything with the bris, uh, the the weight around the hips we found was safe, there wasn't going to be bloody through our back. Um, so we did a lot of sled dragging, so having a really heavy sled, walking backwards, walking forwards, um, that we've got us a real absolute load. Yeah, so it's really low on the hips, it wasn't up around here, we dropped it as far down as possible. Um, and so this sort of became a bit more, I guess, specific strength in that the walkout is actually quite easy, it's the resisting on the way back in becomes a high eccentric strength. So again, that dynamic stability of the hips and the rotators to stop herself from falling around as well as the absolute load to getting through her quads and even the calves there. Yeah. On that one, it's quite, um, I guess, had a bit of a transfer. And again, for us, Kelsey just wanted to be able to feel like she was working hard in that sort of two months when she couldn't do anything in the gym. Um, yep, so again, just from a different angle. Anyone want to have a try? It's, it's, it's a lot harder than it looks going backwards. Um, and even, you know, uh, I think Hardy was saying to us the other day, or well, no, it was Tercy was saying, Kelsey has a really good ankle. She doesn't, her heel doesn't touch the ground at any point in the throw. Um, so we've worked a lot on ankle stiffness and exercise like this where you've really got to maintain that eccentric control of, or even isometric control of the ankle has really helped in. Um, developing that ability to just hold her ankle. So again, walking inwards this way, it's a bit more of a, I guess, a block-specific motion. You've got the, um, 
you know, eccentric loading of the quads, actually gives a bit on that too. Yeah. yeah, still a bit of glue, glue control, so this is another great um, variation we came up with. This is the easy one, I'll show you the, the harder one in a second. The hops. Yeah, and so then, you know, once walking gets too easy, we just add a little hop. So again, you just get a little bit of air time and have to catch yourself, so you get that initial deload and then having to re-engage and catch. Um, again, it's taking strength, trying to make it a bit more dynamic, trying to make it motion-based rather than um, static gym-based strength. Uh, and then, uh, again, uh, Ross Smith, our strength conditioning coach, he's a, he's, I don't know, he's, he's very good. <laughs> He's very creative and he's give him a, an injured athlete or an athlete with um, limitations and he gets really creative. So again, this taking it, making it a bit more uh, movement specific again, adding the shuffling, so you're resisting, falling forward, as well as creating motion at the same time. So um, the big green band has been really helpful for us. And um, let's see. Band. <laughs> band. So and again, it's something we can take on tour. So if we can't find a weight room, we can generally uh, use that to get at least some kind of resistance workout in. It's not there to replace pure strength through squatting and cleaning and Olympic lifting, but it's just another tool in the toolbox that we use uh, with Kelsey to help her development of an athlete. How are you feeling? <laughs> you doing right? um, it's a hurdle drive. We need a hurdle. hurdle or something. Oh, yeah, let's see that. I'll hold it. That's all right. So just set up next one. Um, Do you need help? That'll be all right. So, oh, get up here. Uh, again, um, we're trying to find more single leg stuff. Once double leg becomes easy, we work on single leg. And again, production of force was going to be hard when you've got a lot of that stressy, but we found sort of bit of single leg work, having the band increase with resistance helps obviously maintain um, load through the range of motion, so instead of getting to that end range and being uh, deloaded, she was able to um, obviously maintain the, maintain the load through range, and again, you know, there's plenty of ways you can play around with stuff, I fell over more than once trying to come up with new ideas, and but that's part of the fun of exploring and trying to learn. Um, in the weight room and I think it's obviously important for coaches to understand the strength and conditioning and I guess that our slide about our team, we have a very big team but um, there still is, you know, at the end of the day I'm responsible for the decisions that are made, like we get everyone's advice, we take the best, we take what we um, can from everybody and we listen and then at the end of the day it's, it's I guess I'll fall on my own sword if something goes wrong, I don't want to be able to stand there and blame the strength conditioning coach or blame the sports doctor. I'd rather say that it was my fault, I'll take ownership for what happened. And so that's, um, and I guess that's part of our um, reasoning why we sort of um, take part in all this. So, next bit. So this is, uh, so we've sort of done a lot of lower body stuff and then obviously with Kelsey's um, we talked about sort of linking hips and shoulders and trying to find methods of being elastic as well as um, developing strength. So uh, we kind of come up with a few different ways. Because obviously there's purely creating rotation um, flexion, but there's also resisting rotation and resisting flexion, which are important functions of you know everything that happens between the hips and the shoulders. Uh, which one first? Yeah, so I mean, there's some real basic stuff, and I think David Parker's going to think I've been stealing all his ideas because he's been putting up some really great videos on on his um, website in the last couple of weeks, and you know, I think great minds think alike, and we, we obviously read the same stuff because we do all the same exercises. So this is a basic uh, pallet press, and I mean, it's, it's real simple. So you've got that lateral um, resistance, and you're just trying to press straight out and back, so you're taking the weight away from you. Uh, no one can see that come. Quick, <laughs> uh, yeah. um, 
And so obviously you're resisting rotation as well as um, creating force out there. So the further you take it out, the harder it's going to be. And you're also pulling back in. So it's an anti-rotation exercise. Um, really good. So obviously you've got to set the stable base as well as create motion through here. So it's really important as you push out, you're not uh, shortening your core. You're actually staying long and just feeling the motion through it. Uh, rotations. Yeah, so in the next step there, that was anti-rotation, this is just pure rotation, so again, yep, so just working through range, so setting a stable base through the legs, keeping the arms at a constant range and just working through it, and so this sort of short range, as well as more flowing motion, so driving more from hips on the next one, Kel. That's it, so you can sort of do upper body or you can actually work your hips through more and get a bit more of a drive from there. So you get a connection, hips first and then shoulders. Try that, hip first, shoulders. So work the hip in. And boom, a bit more javelin specific. So again, just changing the way that we're doing the same motion to try and work on movement rather than muscles. Um, so obviously doing it left and right. We're trying to be symmetrical. Um, so again, just, just upper body. And then upper body and stop at halfway. So come in here and then work out. So all the way up and back to there. So you can do partial range, so sort of resisting that final part of rotation. Okay, so using the hip, full range. Again, starting to sort of work backwards, so transitioning your weight left to right. And then making it more hips, hips leaving the shoulders. Yeah, so these are some of the variations we use. We don't use it all every week, but um, as you can see, we, we work more on movements rather than um, specific muscle groups in the way we do these things. Sorry, I've got a list here. Uh, walkouts or walk arounds? Walkouts. Walk out. We do walkouts, though. So. Okay, so um, this one came out of. Again, just a bit of creativity, a bit of boredom. Um, so Kelsey sets a really stable base. I give it a bit of tension and then I slap it around, <laughs> try and create a bit of instability. And Kelsey has to resist against it. And obviously the dynamic nature of the dance means she's not quite sure of where it's going. And has to obviously engage everything to stop me from pulling her over. I still haven't succeeded yet. I'm going to try with your eyes closed. Again, something we haven't done before. Why not? Close your eyes so you can't see where I'm pulling it from. A bit harder? Yeah. Yeah. Change the proprioception. Force the athlete to just react and resist rather than prepare for the motion. Yeah, it's just some bit of fun in the training environment. Yeah, you got to. Train for the coach as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My well, heart rate's up higher than Kelsey's link. Probably not a good thing. Um, so then that's the walk arounds. Again, it's just a bit of dynamic stability of the core. You know, you're engaging every, the whole body. It's not just sitting there and crunching or rotating on the ground. Uh, so I well, usually do this one first. This is just walk outs. Again, finding that static position. And then just increasing the tension. And walking back in, making sure you get a pretty tight grip. I'm yet to slingshot Kelsey with the band. Um, again, this one. Where do you feel that, Kelsey? That side. So it's actually the left side? Yeah, resisting. Resisting that. rotation on this one? Okay. Um, so again, I think it's important to ask your athlete where they're feeling the exercise as well, because I would have thought it would have been more so just anterior and the same size as the band, but I just learned something today, that's good. <laughs> One more. So you want to get really, you can add a little bit of instability at the end of range with that as well. Jurassic, so this one, place to start Again, this is um, really one we've got to be careful with, but this is trying to find that thoracic range of motion. So just give it a really light tension. Kelsey's just going to try and do a figure eight motion through a thoracic there to try and um, 
partly fine range, but then obviously you've got that dynamic stability of trying to set everything through here whilst having motion above the head. So that sort of connection between the hips and the shoulders is really being tested on this one. I wouldn't get any sort of range of motion in that at all. Uh, do you want to face that way? Again, just, oh, actually from the... Yeah. Hmm. What are you guys want to see from, you want to see the posterior or the, the front when she does that? I go from the back. So I like just jump down, you can kind of see that mo rolling motion again, trying to make it as um, flowing as possible. And she moves through there, I'm not trying to let the, the lumbar spine move at all, We're just trying to find range through the thoracic, through the scapula. And Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So again, you can sort of change the motion, just stand there and get some pulses left to right, front to back. Um, have a little break. Any questions, any of those exercises? Does anyone do similar things? No? We're the crazy people, I think. <laughs> okay. Um, Oh yeah, this is a, this is a, this is a painful view. Am I doing this? You forget to it. Um, so again, you can change the pelvic press once that gets really easy. Just write the alphabet with the pelvic press. And the, like, the aim is to actually do like, quite a large range. Up, down, again, it's just... Rather than being stuck with um, you know, single plane motion, we try and make it a bit more dynamic and try and challenge the body to do different things. Um, and again, it's a bit like skill like that whole idea of just exploration, just playing, just trying different things. Um, I try not to be too rigid with that now. When we first started working together, it was very much stick to standard exercises. Da, 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 da. That was us then. In the last two years, we've evolved our knowledge and the way we think about the job and trying the movement. And we've come from much more movement based. So this sort of stuff has become a bit more. You know, we're a bit more comfortable doing it. Kelsey's learned how to engage everything a bit more efficiently to actually get that. So I think that's been a big, um, big change in our training and the way we do things. Um, a bit of shoulder stuff. Oh yeah, cool. Oh, so yeah, these are these are um, exercises for the hip, for the adductors and abductors. Uh, a little bit more advanced than um, so uh, this came from about from again from the hip strength testing other athletes having uh, adductor strains um, and trying to find ways to sort of I guess engage them a bit more without sort of just standing there and pulling down on a band to try and make it a bit more of a connected motion so the, uh, we came up with these bench hip dips and these are very hard. <laughs> um, my groin's hurting just watching them, but yeah, they're, they're obviously better on a slightly higher bench, so that back leg, the bottom leg, doesn't feel like it's about to hit the ground. But again, you've got that dynamic, you know, you're not just working the abductors, you're getting the, everything, the postural muscles working to actually stabilize through here and connect through the hips, so she's getting a bit of a double whammy. And then we do the abductors, the same deal, so dipping up and down. Again, you can add the leg lift if you want to be fancy. Um, Kelsey is there, and you know these these at the moment. How many reps do you use? Sort of, yeah, up to ten reps. But ten reps is pretty hard work. So this is actually a fairly high load strength exercise. So you know you might start out with four or five reps at a time. You don't need to jump straight in and yeah. Um, to make it easier, you just bring the bench in a bit closer. And sort of. Obviously, you take more of the load off your lower leg, work on shorter range of motion stuff. Um, again, the important stuff there is to set straight lines through here. So you break at the hip, you rotate over uh, through your shoulder, you're gonna change the loading. So again, it might be a way to make it easier, but um, when you're trying to make it harder, you're just gonna make sure that your body is aligned. Um, and that's really important for us. So, Shoulder. So again, uh, 2015, Kelsey had obviously lingering shoulder stabilization stuff. Um, so she 
Panorama and a sling in 2012 with a um, elbow. Came back from that. Posterior cuff is atrophied or wasted away. Sports doctor, you know, you've done the your standard 10 to 12 weeks rehab protocol. Sports doctor, cool, start throwing again. There wasn't really any consideration to the actual demands of throwing, so. I didn't to do it, but. <laughs> yeah. Still, like, didn't go straight back into throwing. Well, yeah, there was, there was kind of a real, you know, you hit your 10 week return to play protocol and it's like, boom, straight into it. But there wasn't an ongoing maintenance of the shoulder, I guess, per se. And so that's why in 2014, you know, Kelsey's all starting to come back stronger and she's throwing the jab a lot harder, a lot faster. Achieving greater velocities with the hand, boom, we get a rotator for a super spinatus tear. Um, and so uh, a big thing for us in 2015 was to try and you know, you've got a partial tear, the only way to fix a partial tear is to have surgery, the same surgery you have for a full tear, so you're trying to avoid the knife if possible, and Kelsey's been lucky with her elbow and shoulder, she hasn't had to go under surgery yet, and so to um, avoid, to try and work around it, we just strengthened everything to that posterior shoulder, the rotator cuff muscles as much as possible, initially that's just your basic external rotators, everything like this, but then we start to get more dynamic, um, and so, just, um, the nature of my supraspinatus tear as well is it's on the uh, insertion of the humerus, so it's not like traditionally up here, so a bit further down. On so, the, so yeah, like these traditional ER sort of movements were the ones that were really painful yeah, for me. As soon as you start abducting the shoulder, that's the initial part where Kelsey's tear should should start to hurt. And so, yeah, we we got a lot stronger. Everything was training good, but there was still pain. Kills couldn't get through a night of sleep without waking up most nights with just general throbbing. And when it got cold, it got worse and that sort of thing. So um, she was pretty gutsy that year through 2015. And then the start of the next year, we sat down, we got our national volleyball physio in to do some work with Kels. And she identified a few things that were quite weak. And so she actually found uh, really basic some really basic <laughs> strength was actually quite poor, so uh, upper trap endurance, so just turn around for a sec. So, you know, this is only a two kilo weight, we usually shrug and clean 60, 70 kilos, whatever. Kels couldn't do 10 of these without fatigue, so found that this sort of upper trap region is basic, simple, slightly abducted, um, uh, called shrug was actually quite weak, and so and so yeah, Kelsey's go-to motion would be to do that if she got tired, roll the shoulder forward, protect the trap because it's weak, which, you know, when we're in the gym, it's quite easy to just avoid actually activating your traps and, you know, you can actually sort of work around it and still be strong. Yeah, so we do these left and right-handed. So we started doing these in conjunction with a few other shoulder exercises and um, shoulder pain started to go away. There's been points in the last 12 months where Kels hasn't done these low level exercises for more than seven days and that pain starts to creep back in. So um, <laughs> correlation doesn't always equal causation, but for Kels, it's just something simple that we just, she just has to add in every second day to do these shrugs as well as um, some slightly more functional, I guess, movements with the shoulder, which I guess has I don't know, we're not going to say she's cured, but we've found ways around it and she's strong enough now that this doesn't, she hasn't had issues touch wood in that shoulder for the past 11 months or so. Um, so what we've done here is we tied, initially what was the initial one? Yeah, just an initial row and the row, external rotation, uh, extension and down, so you really... Um, Producing and then resisting with the ex rotator cuff, and then we just try to be more creative. We just started again, trying to make it more flowing and um, yeah, doing reverse. Yeah, doing reverse back and forward. So just again, I don't know we, what do we call these swimmers? We just came up with that motion. It didn't come out of a textbook. It was just a bit of playing around and you know certain. We looked at the demands of what she needed to do at the shoulder. Yeah, this sort of stuff just wasn't working, so we tried to make it a bit more <coughs> functional for what Kelsey was um, uh, comfortable doing. And 
you know, again, some real, instead of doing the lateral raise with the, with the weight all out here, we just shortened up the moment arm and um, do it in, in tight. Again, just only get up to seven kilo dumbbells because um, as soon as the quality of the movement changes and she starts to hitch or drive it up from the legs, we're not achieving the purpose of the exercise, so we stop there. As you can see, it's developed a lot more bulk on the, on the posterior cuff. Um, oh, another one we used is a, what do you call that? Like a body blade or a, a wobble board. So it's like a, a handle with two flexible things on either end. So you just kind of, as you move around, it, it has rotation and vibration. And then it's kind of a dynamic stabilizer for the shoulder. Um, that's something again, just working with basic proprioception uh, through the shoulder, which we've worked on a lot this year, also in the last two years. Um, basic, just warming up the med balls, just tapping the ball against the wall, and just really focusing on isolating the shoulder and just moving through here and not hitching and that sort of stuff has been really important. Um, shoulder walks. And try those. Um, another one we did. In the early stages, we don't do it much at the moment because Kelsey's got a left, bit of left, left wrist time forwards, backwards. Again, just um, make it a bit more dynamic. So, walking on your hands. So, basically, like you're walking up a ladder. Um, and imagine you know, this is like your glute, and you're trying to set your um, forearm in, the, in your shoulder capsule and just really engage everything on the back. So, forwards, backwards. It's a bit of proprioception, it's a bit of dynamic stabilization side of it. Do it sideways, um, same deal. Again, it's just slightly challenging, slightly different motions. I've done these in about six months, so who cares? <laughs> um, this is something uh, Steve Backley showed us a couple when, I, when we first started working. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so that was a really good exercise. And there's maybe one or two things there which I'd say we. Um, invented, but there's probably other people in the world doing the exact same stuff, so everything I do I report from other people and I think that's pretty common, so I don't claim to be innovative or new, I just take other people's ideas and critically think about whether that would help my athlete, and then if I do think it will, we just experiment with it, and if Kelsey likes it and I think it works, then we'll just stick with it for a little bit. Um, we'll generally stick with something for at least three weeks to see whether it actually works, we don't really Unless it's an, unless there's pain or just it just seems too stupid, we won't um, dish it straight away. But we generally try to stick with things to see whether they um, have an adaptation. But anything else? Cool. Any questions about anything we've talked about this morning? <laughs> or does anyone have a go at any of these exercises? <laughs> nope. <laughs> um, yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, so uh, Kelsey's got a very long warm up, I guess, compared to most throwers, especially on comp day. Um, sort of, we start with the dynamic mobility, sort of go through those screens, triggering. Um, and then for the shoulder, it's, we start with. Yeah. And then, Forward throws, um, backward throws. Uh, oh, the discus, discus throw, throw, hammer throw, hammer throw uh, uh, internal, external throws, and then like a ball loop. Type so action. just sort of four or five reps of each of those with a 400 gram ball just to warm the shoulder up, just test if there's any tightness. There. From there, we then uh, we started warming up with a baseball. We played catch, so uh, that came about with Kelsey's shoulder injury. We couldn't throw javelins, but we could still roll the arm over from a standing position. 15 meters, sorry, back injury. Um, still throw 15 meters and play catch. And at that point, I could actually reach Kelsey's glove. Um, and then it sort of evolved into now we warm up and Kelsey's lobbing, you know, just standing there and trying at 60 meters. I'm underarming her back because I can't get it that far. But I guess that gradually warms up the shoulder in terms of the speeds, speed demands for throwing. So we kind of, you know, each start at 30 meters, 40, 45. And each time she has to try to be further, the arm has to work a bit faster, starts to get a bit more connection. From there, we then move on to weight balls, so sort of um, 400, 500 gram balls. We do 
Uh, in a 600, we do about 15 or 20 of those. In, on a comp day, we'd only do a couple. But then, and then we go into stabs, and if you're lucky, there's a warm up area you can throw a jab, otherwise, into competition. Um, so, yeah, it's a pretty progressive warm up. We just work our way out, and the shoulder's kind of good now that we don't we haven't really had any issues with it, but we still have the same system in place because it mentally helps prepare Kelsey as well. Just it really kind of evolves and um, go from step to step. I'll jump on that question and ask, uh, since you had the problem, and I'm very familiar with shoulder problems myself, uh, do you have a sort of setup you do after a constitution for recovery for the shoulder? Or you just, uh, yeah? Uh, so, we have an amazing recovery center in Canberra where we have you know, a massive ice bath, we've got a sort of moderately temperature bath and we've got a really warm one. Um, initially we just, you know, all the research was cold water immersion, that was what you do, so Kelsey jumped in there but we actually found it was worse for her. Putting ice on the shoulder it actually like tensed it up, so we rather put heat post competition, so if, if it's a bit tender she'd probably put a um, heat pack on there rather than a jump in an ice bath because the ice bath also tightens up the hips and the back so but yeah I find generally speaking uh, for me uh, the warmer the better uh, for my body in general so yeah as much heat as I can especially if it's stiff uh, tends to really help loosen it up 